Hello, our audience, Prime Log, uh, Prime Media. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today, I'm joined with uh, three amazing guests. Um, Tababo Asafa from Washington, D.C., um, uh, Melvin Foote, uh, and Riva Livingston. I'm going to allow them to uh, introduce themselves. I'm very familiar with all the work that they do, um, both in U.S. and Africa engagement. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with Melvin. Uh, Melvin, if you could uh, please uh, take a moment to introduce yourself. I'm uh, very happy uh, to be here. Uh, my name is Melvin Foote. I'm the president of the Constituency for Africa. We are a Washington, D.C.-based education and advocacy organization, and we lobby on uh, U.S.-Africa policy. Uh, my um, relationship with Ethiopia goes back about 50 years. Uh, I started out as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia. Actually, my first year was in Asmara, but because of the war, I was moved to Harar uh, my second year. And then I stayed a third year teaching at the American school uh, out by the old airport. I've uh, been involved with Ethiopia uh, ever since. I've been back to Ethiopia on numerous occasions. I was part of a delegation that monitored uh, well, it helped to stop the war in 2010 between Ethiopia and Eritrea. I monitored elections in Baligoba, uh, uh, and I went to the, the referendum in, in Eritrea and Asmara. Um, I've been back on a number of occasions for events at the Africa Union um, and at the uh, Economic Commission for Africa. So I follow Ethiopia quite closely. Um, I, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm very much engaged. Uh, you know, learn, I know about a lot of the issues. Uh, I differ in opinion on some of the politics of Ethiopia. I guess we're going to get into some of that. But uh, it's always great to, to be a part of uh, the Ethiopia community and to address uh, critical issues concerning uh, the Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Um, and then, uh, Ms. Riva, if you could please uh, introduce yourself to our guests. My name is Reva Levinson. I'm the president and CEO of a consultancy out of Washington, D.C. It's called KRL International. I've been working in Africa for about 33 years. I do not have the long history of Mel in Ethiopia, which is remarkable, Mel. I didn't realize that uh, you had that 50-year history there, but I do have a lot of experience in, um, in post-conflict countries. I've worked in Liberia and Sierra Leone, also um, during the time in South Sudan. That was actually the last time I was in Ethiopia, was uh, shuttling back and forth with EGAD during the, um, during the South Africa, in the South Sudan uh, civil war, which started on, on Christmas Eve of 2013. Um, I'm also a uh, author of a book and a columnist and try to keep Africa and its relevance to the United States in the news through a column in um, The Hill over a little bit. So, Mabu, if you could please uh, introduce yourself. And Okay, now about me. Uh, I usually have a hard time defining what I am. I am uh, one of those uh, jack of many trades, a master of none. Uh, but uh, everything goes around Africa. Uh, originally, I'm from Ethiopia. I left Ethiopia at a young age. I finished high school in Kenya, and everything I sweet in life, I got to know in Kenya. Kenya is my home, and I've lived in Europe, uh, and then uh, here I am in America since 1980. So for all the practical purposes, I'm a global citizen, but with a very profound African identity. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning my, my routes in life to say Wherever I went, I knew about the people I visited, but the people I visited did not know anything about me. And that kind of offended me because Africa is giant. Africa is magical. Africa is beautiful. Africa is a cradle of civilization. There's so much about Africa, but the international narrative written by someone else offended me. And all, all my life, I wanted to be a storyteller, to recorrect, to redefine the African narrative, narrative, the whole spectrum from an African perspective. So I went to school, studied communication, uh, studio art, uh, fil filmmaker. I wanted to be an African photographer, an African film, film filmmaker to retell. At, at the end of the day, we're all, you know, creation of God. You know, we're 
part of this magic rainbow, but the political system that we have lived under has divided us with isms and schisms. So I went to the coffee growing region to tell a story, but it was hard. I was shocked and, and, and I mean, you know, it was the first time I went back after such a long time and to see hardworking husbands and wives and kids in the coffee growing region from sunrise to sundown, they can't even eat clean, I mean, drink clean water or three meals a day. I asked why, why do they work so hard? So quickly from a, a storyteller, I became an activist. And I say to myself, in fact, I came back, I remember coming back and I said to my wife, forget about telling a story. People are, people need economic empowerment. So I'm gonna put my, 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 my camera aside and, and, and see if I can use my talent to open market for them. So that led to a lot of up and down. And today I call myself an activist, a community activist, social entrepreneur, and I, I proudly wear uh, a title, my wife and I, and uh, many other community members and uh, leaders have supported. Uh, we, at the end, ended up creating a new international, a new international trade guild toward, towards development. Initially, we called it Virtual Exchange Beyond Fair Trade that gives all the stakeholders an investment and profit sharing opportunity. And in the case of coffee, we gave 400,000 small coffee farmers organized under one cooperative union a $6 per farmer investment opportunity there, 400,000. They can afford to pay to invest $6. That's close to $3 million. And I have really worked hard on this side and I have social investors lined up. So between the two, I want to connect the farmer with the consumer, create a social inter enterprise that gives both of them an opportunity not to, to only have an economic exchange, also cultural exchange. Today, that model is called U.S. Uh, Benefit Cooperation for Africa Initiative. At the time, my state senator, now a congressman, Jamie Raskin in 2010, created a new legislation called Benefit Cooperation. It's a hybrid of nonprofit and for-profit that comes together, it makes profit, but it also cares for the common good. Literally, it's like, it has a quadruple bottom line. People, planet, profit, and purpose. So today, my wife and I are a proud founders of the Benefit Corporation for Africa and Blessed Coffee, the coffee business, as a first prototype. We're also a co-founder of the U.S. Africa Diaspora Business Council that aspires, aspires, to connect the purchasing investment power of the African diaspora here in the U.S. with a potential in Africa and a business venture that can promote humanity, that can tell, redefine the African narrative and provide the African diaspora an opportunity to create wealth while addressing the most pressing and, and, and urgent challenge we face, mostly in Africa, but also here in our communities. I'm sorry, that's a long one, but that's my blues. Okay, so um, one of the reasons why uh, uh, I wanted us to have this discussion is obviously because um, I know the, extent, the extensive experience all uh, three of you have. Um, and Melvin, uh, I've reached out to you several times in the past and Riva, I'm very much aware of the work, uh, especially when I went to Liberia, uh, the work that you have done and uh, this is, uh, a way of me saying, uh, please also come to Ethiopia. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that brings me uh, to the topic of discussion. Um, uh, as we all know, Ethiopia is going through a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of challenging and hopeful times. And I kind of wanted to um, discuss that. Um, um, as we all know that uh, Ethiopia has, um, a few years ago, um, was able um, uh, to have a transition uh, by the power of the people for the first time, at least in my lifetime, um, to see a, a 30 year um, uh, dictatorship uh, was toppled. And uh, since then, um, uh, we are currently still under uh, transition. Um, we've uh, had unfortunate situation where um, the previous uh, TPLF dominated leadership, uh, 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 admittedly um, attacked the Northern uh, Command uh, in Ethiopia. And since then we've had some uh, uh, 
sad uh, humanitarian crisis and um, most of the challenges and uh, the need for all the actions have been recently uh, published by uh, the prime minister uh, on, uh, uh, on the <clears throat> project syndicate. And uh, I wanted us to uh, kind of have a discussion of what you think. Uh, I'm going to be posing this question to Melvin and Riva um, about, uh, you know, what do you think about Ethiopia's um, situation and the need for strategists? Uh, do, does Ethiopia uh, need strategists uh, to help her through this uh, post-conflict uh, transition? And uh, I wanted to get your ideas on this matter. I'll start with Melvin again. Okay, I, again, I go back to uh, Ethiopia since 1973. And at the time, there was a famine going on in the country. Uh, there was the uh, overthrow of the Haile Selassie regime and uh, incoming the Derg. I was there for all of that. And I speak some Amharic, I speak Tigrinya, uh, I speak some Adirinya, you know. So I, uh, you know, I was in the people's square when, uh, you know, when the Derg came to power and Mengistu and all that. So I go back a ways. Uh, when I see uh, Ethiopia, uh, wonderful people. You know, they're not better people anywhere in the world. Uh, the culture is so rich, you know. Um, uh, you know, it, it was absolutely uh, mind-boggling to be uh, in a country that, you know, goes back to, uh, you know, the beginning of, of, of Christianity, you know. Um, and then the legacy of Ethiopia, the history is just absolutely profound. So I'm certainly, uh, I want to uh, put that out there. Now, having said that, uh, the 50 years that I have... Uh, been in Ethiopia and following Ethiopia uh, have been just a, a up and down. I mean, every time you turn around, there's another crisis. And, uh, you know, back then it was Ethiopia, Tekadim, you know, Akakaz, Udim, you know. Um, all right, so I was there. Then I was there in 2010 uh, between the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia over Badame. Um, and something like 10,000 people died as a result of that war. Many of them were peasants, soldiers, uh, you know, innocent, really, people who were at the behest of the government. Um, and then I've seen um, uh, the Ethiopia famine, We Are the World. I was there for that. Uh, had a chance to uh, take a delegation, Jesse Jackson's wife, and uh, went through uh, Tigray, Wallow, uh, McKelly, and saw the famine firsthand. I've seen that. I've seen uh, the independence movement, uh, uh, where uh, Eritrea became independent country, uh, you know, monitor the election. So I've seen all of this. So when I hear about the the crisis in Tigray, TPLF, and and uh, what has gone on there, you know, it, it 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 hurts me. It hurts me because this country, and I'm saying the country regionally, and you could throw in Sudan if you like. Uh, you could throw in uh, uh, Eritrea certainly. Uh, it's constantly in turmoil. You know. It's constantly in crisis. And it's constantly asking us here in the United States, um, it's asking my government, you know, uh, come and take this one. This guy is a bad guy. This one is a good guy. Uh, help us, don't help them. Um, and it's absolutely confusing to the US Congress. And I can say that one of the reasons why the response from the US is not what you want it to be is because people just simply can't get a sense of what do these people want, you know? Uh, and I'm an advocate for Africa. I, I want Ethiopia to go forward. Ethiopia, Tekadem is okay by me. But, um, you know, uh, somehow these issues have got to be resolved. It's not like, uh, you know, when I see Ethiopians fight near a tree, and I'm looking at them, both of the languages came from Jez. You know, the people look the same. They eat the similar food. The, the music is similar. These are brothers and sisters. These are not... Uh, uh, absolutely different people, but yet uh, life has become so cheap that, um, you know, uh, so my, 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 my wish is that the people of the region will resolve these issues and figure out a way to go forward as a community uh, that we can start to work with. But the way it is right now, uh, all I see is setback, setback, setback. I talked to Congresswoman Bass and others, and they, 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 they want to help. But there's, there's problems all over Africa with COVID-19. 
the problems now with Ebola re-emerging in West Africa. There's all kinds of issues to do with Boko Haram in, in Nigeria. Uh, how do we focus attention if the people themselves will not agree to come together and work out their differences and find a way to go forward as an international community? Thank you, Melvin. Reva? That's, that's Mel, always a wallflower, always afraid to express his opinion. <laughs> no, it's what we, we uh, love about Mel in Washington because he speaks from both a strength of character and a deep knowledge. And he brings that to every discussion that he has. So maybe I would uh, just make a couple points because I didn't do that at the opening. One is I also am a, a, a big fan of uh, Ethiopia, both its history, its culture, and the, um, the storytellers. I know your, your question is about strategists, and um, I think that uh, everybody you know, needs a good strategist only because you don't know what you don't know. And there's always benefit from listening to other people who have gone through similar experiences. Um, Ledet, you and I met um, virtually in uh, just after uh, uh, Prime Minister Ahmed Abi got the Nobel Peace Prize. It was very controversial. I think Mel and Tababu, you 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 remember. And um, despite the um, earliness of the Peace Prize bestowed on him, um, Ledet, as you know, I supported it. You know, I supported it because I recalled that President Sirleaf was under that same criticism, you know, early in her career getting the Peace Prize, but also Liberia not yet fully emerging from post-conflict. But I wrote something, and I think it's, um, it's pretty apropos as we go forward, and then I'll pivot, um, Ledette, to the, um, to the Project Syndicate column. I say that prize or no prize, Abiy Ahmed has an uphill climb. And unlike Sir, Sir Leaf, he is appointed, not elected, with the longevity and durability of his reforms dependent upon the patience of the ruling Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front and his ability to translate his star power into popularity during next year's national elections. I know some of that expectation got a bit uh, challenged with COVID-19, but you know that, that's how I saw things at the time. And how I see things now is that I, um, I think what he represents and what happened in 2018 in the appointment of the first woman president of Ethiopia was historic and particularly for the young people, the people who had been petitioning for 30 years for their voice to be heard. And so there was this great opportunity. And I think uh, Mel, as you know, it captured the imagination of so many people. This young 40 plus year old uh, prime minister who was not held back by the constraints of history, of tribe, of place, and was projecting forward. And so we were all in a very positive place. I think what Mel was referring to is that this crisis, however it unfolded, right? And we all know COVID-19 contributed to it because the Tigray region decided to move ahead with elections. We know there was back, there was um, attacks back and forth. There's a grave humanitarian crisis. But the point that Mel is making, and I'd like to make as well, is w whatever started it and whatever, who was ever at fault, and I think the prime minister in his project syndicate article speaks to a lot of the important issues out there, but um, the blame is clear, Ledette, in his interpretation of results. You know, we were provoked. This was the wrong thing to do. And we responded to protect our national sovereignty and our people and the right of Ethiopia to be together as a single nation. Nobody's gonna disagree with that. But the challenge now is that positions have been hardened there is no discussion going on. And I know earlier this summer, because President Sirleaf was part of the mission that went to Addis, is that the prime minister at that time felt a bit under siege and didn't want anybody else, no envoys, no other African leaders to come and to get involved in a conflict because the tension was so high. And uh, so getting back to where we are, what Mel said and where the United States is, is uh, you know, 
Ethiopians themselves need to de-escalate and they need to stand down and have some type of truce, both rhetorical, you know, from a national security perspective, the uh, lights, the electricity, the internet need to go back on in the region and people have to be able to take care of those whose lives have been disrupted, not only in the North, but over in Sudan. So there has to be a willingness, and this is again what Mel said, because I'm just pivoting on his advice, he's got deeper knowledge than I do, that there needs to be de-escalation by the parties themselves. And that's something that's really important. I did not see that, Ledette, in the Project Syndicate article. I saw very important objectives and the definition of how you um, support your democracy, but the path towards de-escalation, I didn't see that. So if I were a strategist, and that's what you're asking, I would say there needs to be a path to de-escalation and there needs to be a recognition of the tremendous suffering. Um, and, and you see it, I was just reading the Guardian article about um, you know, people say that there was mass human rights abuses. Nobody knows that, nobody knows who did what, the role of Eritrea, the role of provocation. At the end of the day, it's in everybody's benefit to have independence, have the settling of those people, and then also the ability for, um, for an investigation to go on. So again, de-escalation, independence, and then the other thing which I find very encouraging, and Tababu, I think we haven't seen this in a while, is we have an administration, the Biden administration, that's now five and a half weeks into office and has mentioned Africa, specific African nations, African conflicts, African objectives, more than Donald Trump did, Mel, <laughs> in four years. You know, he, last week, it was a uh, during the G7 meeting, he agreed to not only provide uh, $4 billion to COVAX, which is the global um, access to COVID-19 vaccines, but also freed up the next generation of vaccines from Novavax to be able to be purchased by the government and donated. Unfortunately, those will not be to the third or fourth quarter, but it's a really big deal. I say that as a basis because the other thing that they're thinking about the Biden administration, if what you read and hear is true is they're very concerned about the crisis in the Horn of Africa, the destabilization of Ethiopia right now because of the conflict and what that could mean for a region so vital to our national security. So there is serious consideration, and Mel, I'd love your opinion on this if what I'm hearing is the same as you, is um, to look at the potentially, potentially a special envoy that would have credibility and authority to be able to work with Prime Minister Ahmed Abi and the other regional leaders and boost up the African Union and EGAD and East Africa to be able to fight to, to deal with a global platform for resolving um, for resolving the issue. And I believe that there's uh, there's great interest there. But again, not to uh, parrot Mel, but I usually do that. Is that the path forward, and I learned this from the work I did in other post-conflict nations, there has to be a path provided by the country itself and by the leadership itself, because nobody can come in and impose. They can only support the platform that's there. So the debt. <laughs> so just, just, just uh, su summarizing, I mean, I think that the country would benefit from strategists um, that have seen these issues before and seen what happens when um, your rhetoric is so high that there's no space to even hear what each other is thinking and then crisis upon crisis just escalates. And I think that we're at a point with the Biden administration where they can play a significant role and they have authority and credibility, not just because of the policies that are projected, but because of the individuals that they put in place that have a long history in, Af in Africa. So I would just sum it up there and uh, Ledette turn it back over to, um, to I guess it would be to Babu to, to respond to. Yes, thank you, Riva. Actually, Tababu, I wanted um, to get your uh, 
feedback or uh, I would like for you to add, what is the role of the African immigrant community? I, I mean, it's uh, sort of what um, uh, Melvin and Riva have kind of put that on the community as well. So I really want you uh, to uh, give us your feedback on that. The most intriguing identity in the whole planet Earth is the word, the identity coined as African-American. I'll come back to that, but let me quickly um, give you a feedback on the, on the comments Brother Melvin and, and Sister Lewis um, um, gave us. I completely understand and I share their, their sentiment. Uh, but there's another track that has to be considered. They, they, uh, uh, Melvin gave a very good uh, historical background of the conflicts in Ethiopia within the country. But uh, there is another context that we have to pay attention to. That is the external factor. The history of Ethiopia, like the history of Africa, has been shaped in response to the aggression of the outside world in shaping its, uh, to this month we're gonna celebrate the 125th anniversary of Adwa, where Italians were stopped on their tracks. That was the last, the last land that Europeans have not colonized up there. They, the Berlin Conference, they scrambled Africa and they went all over Africa, shaped Africa inside out. And uh, so we have to pay attention to the external factors that contributed. We cannot dismiss it because it plays a very critical role. Even today, even today, Africa is under siege. The economic order that put in place, the resource extraction and, 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 sh and sending it to Europe to be manufactured and back, sold back to Africans. That is the economic infrastructure the colonials have, have put in place that has never been touched. And so the global perspective has to be considered when we provide, an, an, because it's internal and external. You know, the crisis today between the you know, Avi and, uh, and, and, and the Northern Tigray goes to the times of Antetiedros, where um, em Emperor Johannes brought the, 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 the British to, 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 to overrun the country, take the country over. It has that segment all the way down. And then the, what the British did, the Nile issue, what the Egyptians have done, what the Arab countries have done to dismantle Ethiopia, the finances they put to... To, 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 to put the freedom fighters, reshape. I mean, everything about Ethiopia, like Africa, there is internal and external factor. So we have to pay both attention. We have to pay, we have to take the longer and we have to be very honest and bold. Look at the, the, the problem within and look at the problem from outside. So, so we'll have a very good diagnosis of the situation and, and we'll come up with a, a good strategy to, to move out of that. That said, let me, Put another ranch into this. First of all, I, I am into this conversation as an Ethiopian American, as an African American, because I'm a naturalized citizen since 87. I've made myself here for all the practical purposes. I left Ethiopia at a young age as a victim of the Cold War. Even my personal story, at the age of 15, I was displaced. And that has to do something with the, with the consequence of the global, the, the Cold War. I mean, all our lives individually and as a nation has been shaped. And here I am as an American. I made myself an American. I believed in the, in the, in the, in the democracy and the promise of America. And as an Ethiopian, as an African, as a global citizen, one thing I know, looking back, 60% of the problem in Ethiopia is not internal. It's poverty is the issue and poverty is caused by the under-marginalized presence of Africans in the global market. I mean, I was in Niem, Niger in 2018 was the signature of the African continental freighted area. And the hotel I slept, I drank coffee that came from Swiss. The Swiss don't, they don't produce coffee, but the coffee that was sent. And then my tea option was a Kenyan tea shipped to England and came back as a, as a British, British breakfast tea. Everything Africa produces, it doesn't, uh, Every gives is sent out as a raw material and comes back to us at a higher cost. The cocoa farmer in West Africa cannot afford to buy a chocolate made in Swiss. And so there is that element, that poverty as a result of the marginalization of Africa from colonization to current extract 
extract economy, dominance, the geop we have to pay attention to that. In fact, if Ethiopians come together and resolve their, their, their conflict, at best, they will resolve 40% of their problem. If they stand as brothers and sisters, they still have to overcome the under marginalized presence they have culturally, politically, economically, and the global scale. I mean, if you type, go, go to Google and say, who are the coffee producing countries? Five African countries. And type another one, who's making money from the global coffee? Five European nations. Why is that? That is the economic system, global economic system we're supporting. So we have to pay attention to that. And then, and then, and then we'll be able to address the issue. That said, let me come to my favorite subject in the whole world is <laughs> African American. It fascinates me. I am, I feel blessed to have that identity. You know, when the Obama administration uh, recognized my work and in 2012 gave us a champion of change award for the dream that I had to build this international trade that gives marginalized farmers an opportunity to invest and compete in this global and this free market. And I was on the audience. I know, I know Brother Melvin were there, and there were about three, four hundred people in the room, bright, intelligent, powerful members of the African American community, as well as the recent immigrants. And I'm seeing, sitting there, they are in one room, but they're so disconnected. They're so suspicious. They're not talking to one another. You know, first and foremost, African immigrants have forgotten they're enjoying the privilege of Africa because of the price paid. And so our understanding of the African-American community is brokered by some image maker, which is, which is demented. The same, the same with the African-American uh, African -Ameri African community about Africa. And mind you, the two identities, Africa and America, Africa is rich with resources, magical place. America is where alchemy happens, vibrant, open, magical, things can happen, boom. If we can calibrate the best of the two to come together, if we can calibrate the best of the two to come together, humanity has hope. So we cannot dis talk about Ethiopia in isolation, you know, and because we're one big family. By the way, there's no flag in the global economic order. There are people who own of the big billion billion dollar businesses who own who own uh, who own the infrastructure and those the rest of us who try to strive. So we have to be strategic on both levels. First and foremost, you're right, brother Merwin. Brothers have to get up to get their senses and realize, you know, they're just wasting their energy, their bright energy and time was nonsense. But we have to understand, we have to understand I mean, if you look at the current, uh, if you look at the current uh, um, economic, ethnic, ethnic challenge, you can trace it back to a lot of external fact. The, 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 the Arab, Arab countries have invested so much to finance the, the revelation from, from PLF to, to Eritrea. Eritrea itself is a, a creation of the colonial powers of the world. So, I mean, I speak, uh, I speak as an African-American, a new immigrant, a, a new member of the African-American community. What I want to see is how can we build a bridge between this vast, vast power of the African-American community that has survived. The resilience is amazing. You know, the vibrancy is amazing. The human capacity is amazing. The purchasing power is trillions and trillions of dollars. How can we pair it with the potential in Africa for the world, not only for Africa, for mutual benefits? So to me, uh, I want to stay on my lane. My dream is to build that bridge. I want many, Af many African-Americans to go. You know, I have a lot of friends who are eager and determined and have the capacity they want to go but the fear of africa the mis the fear of africa created out of it's a myth just like racism is a myth and so i think i'm all over the place but to answer your question uh yes the salvation for africa in the world is for the two identities to come together and 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 work you know 2018 
uh, the Iraqi government passed an act, built up act, they re restructured the international development financial infrastructure, DFC established, they have $60 billion. They want to uh, rearrange the, the, the value chain from China towards Africa. The head of the DFC went to Ethiopia. How can we make that influence? How can we tell our President Biden uh, policy? By the way, Ethiopia is, has 100 years of relationship with the US. Ethiopia sits on the, north, on the Horn of Africa, a strategic is a, I mean, a strategic place. What is, as an Americans, we can do to make sure that American foreign policy is based on democracy, trade, and prosperity? How can we use that foreign place, I mean, foreign policy, and, and use leverage the power of business and address poverty as we look at the infrastructure that is dismantled? Maybe if we can, if we can approach it from two perspectives. I think there is hope. Thank you, the, Babu. The I appreciate it.